Hi everyone, today I will be talking about some of the basics of infectious disease epidemiology and some of this information will be useful as you work on assignment six, which covers an outbreak that happened in Argentina. So quick learning objectives. Um, we'll do some reviewing and that includes covering what the epidemiologic transition is. We'll also talk some, a fair amount today, about um, immunity, so herd immunity and vaccines to prevent diseases. And that kind of leads us into disease eradication. I'll also be talking about how we measure outbreaks or epidemics. So specifically, I'll be covering some epidemic curves and how to calculate attack rates that can help us identify what might be causing an outbreak. So here's the review part. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the semester, but between basically over the course of the 20th century, between 1900 and early 2000s, uh, we saw what we call the epidemiologic transition, which is essentially moving from infectious diseases being a major, the major causes of uh, death in the United States and other similar countries to seeing more chronic diseases being those leading causes of death. Um, so we still see pneumonia and influenza shows up on that list. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of uh, infect non-infectious diseases, sorry, non-communicable diseases and other types of um, health concerns like suicide that are major, major causes of death. Also, this slide should be review. Um, I think we talked about it earlier in the semester, but if not, I believe you've probably seen it in your environmental health class. And it's just a reminder that, you know, infectious diseases in particular are not just about the individual. It's this um, relationship between people, their environments, and then the actual agents or hosts, pathogens that might be causing the disease. And so depending on how these relate to each other can inform what kinds of prevention efforts we implement. Um, so for example, if it's something like a mosquito-borne disease, then we could try to interrupt that uh, pathogen environment arrow there by removing breeding grounds, getting rid of standing water, that sort of thing. Um, or we could, you know, interventions that are aimed at changing our activity patterns, like encouraging us to stay home and social distance. Um, that's a way to, to kind of interrupt that host environment interaction. And then um, if we wanna to try to educate people and give them tools to protect themselves, things like mosquito netting come to mind, uh, that is trying to interrupt the host and agent arrow there. And we did talk about this earlier in the semester that a lot of the history of epidemiology really is a history of infectious diseases and managing infectious diseases. So John Snow famously broke the pump handle off the Broad Street pump to stop a cholera epidemic before there was really an understanding that cholera was caused by an infectious agent. Um, and that really illustrated that we don't always need to know the exact cause of a disease to stop an outbreak. It's helpful, of course. Um, but we can use a lot of these epidemiologic tools to understand transmission and um, the spread of disease, even if we don't know all the details yet about the underlying agent that's causing it. Of course, Ignaz Semmelweis, who has gotten some time on the Google homepage lately as we deal with uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, um, he was really the first to demonstrate that washing your hands is an effective way to prevent the spread of disease. But unfortunately, we saw with him, and we've seen many times since then, that even when we have evidence, um, it doesn't always change practice right away. It can take a long time to make shifts in the way that people behave. And then finally, um, HIV, which emerged in the early 1980s, is an illustration that word choice matters. It says GRID there because originally it was termed gay-related immune disease, which of course we know is not the case, HIV can infect anyone. Um, and that really did contribute to misunderstanding and some fear about new diseases. And I think we've seen that even with this current outbreak, um, you know, it was sort of called the Wuhan coronavirus initially as shorthand for where we first saw it emerge, um, but that has kind of contributed to some of this spread of belief that it's somehow connected to China. Um, you know, these kinds of diseases can occur anywhere. We've seen them arise all, all over the world, 
I'll talk at the end about the 1918 pandemic influenza briefly. And our best evidence for that is that it arose here in the US in uh, Kansas. So diseases have popped up all over the place. We never really know where they're gonna come from, except that um, especially novel ones tend to occur in places where people have interaction with animals. And so there's the potential for spread between species, but that doesn't really narrow it down very much since lots of us have interactions with animals and lots of us live in pretty densely populated areas. Okay, so um, the other issue that comes, a lot, uh, comes up a lot in infectious disease epidemiology and just managing outbreaks in general um, is the legal side of things. And it's one of those times when we really have to think hard about the balance between individual liberty and public good. And again, I think the current pandemic illustrates this um, again, that some people don't want to stay home. They don't want to, um, you know, for lots of legitimate reasons, you know, work is important. People need to earn a living. And so there are lots of people who are in a situation where they can't telework. And so going to work is important for them. Uh, but in terms of the public good, we know that right now the best way to slow this outbreak in the U.S. is to keep away from each other. Um, so it's always a it's always a difficult balancing act. And while um, public health power, powers are actually pretty broad, uh, generally is legal to, for example, force people into quarantine. Uh, but we tend to not do that because the public doesn't like it. And so we don't want to um, overstep bounds. We want to encourage um, positive behavior change and complying with recommendations and regulations rather than taking drastic action to enforce them. Uh, you may also have noticed that as stay-at-home orders have been rolled out in different forms across the country, although law enforcement agents are empowered to arrest people and so forth, we haven't seen a lot of that. So again, the idea is that people are informed about why we need to make these changes, encouraged to make the changes, but not to, for example, incarcerate them if they don't comply. I'm gonna come back to herd immunity later, uh, but I will just note that vaccination is of course a legal requirement for children to enter school in most states. And over the past oh, 20 years, 30 years probably, uh, we've start to see, st started to see vaccination coverage drop. And so there have actually been some changes to laws, previously exemption laws in some states were very broad and people could essentially opt out of vaccination for um, non-religious reasons. <clears throat> and those have actually been kind of tightened in recent years as we've seen the coverage rates drop. And we'll talk later in this lecture about the importance of having high levels of vaccine coverage in the population in order to prevent outbreaks. And finally, isolation and quarantine. We've talked about before, isolation is when we ask people who are sick, people who have symptoms to stay home, um, to stay away from others. And quarantine is when we ask people who are not symptomatic, who don't appear to be sick, don't have any evidence of infection, to stay separate from other people. Uh, so quarantine is a more challenging type of approach. Generally, isolation is pretty straightforward. People who don't feel well tend to be more likely to comply with requests to stay away from others. Uh, but maybe the most famous historical figure is Typhoid Mary, who uh, to the best of our knowledge, was a carrier of typhoid but never had any symptoms herself. But she was linked to a number, she was an in-home cook primarily, um, linked to a number of outbreaks of disease and some deaths because she was shedding this virus and she was repeatedly um, asked to essentially stop working as a, as a cook so she could limit the spread of disease and was ultimately incarcerated basically against her will. Um, because she just wouldn't comply because she didn't believe that she was sick. So it kind of illustrates the challenge and that uh, balance the decisions we sometimes need to make to put the public good over individual liberty. So a few terms that may be familiar to you, but I just want to make sure they're clear. Um, endemic means that the disease, a disease is occurring at kind of the level that we expect. So it's kind of a background number of cases that are always happening. Flu, for example, has a seasonality to it, but there's still 
a level, a certain number of cases of flu we expect to see every year. An epidemic is when that number goes higher than what we expect. Um, so an outbreak and epidemic are essentially interchangeable terms. Um, and there's no single threshold across diseases. It depends on not only the disease, but where you are. So for example, um, you know, here in Boone, we don't really see cases of things like West Nile virus very often because <clears throat> we don't have that many mosquitoes. So it might only take a couple of cases for us to be at an outbreak level of West Nile, whereas somewhere closer to the equator, even somewhere in the country like Florida, um, their threshold level is probably higher than it is here because they have more mosquitoes, so more mosquito-borne diseases and more expected cases of West Nile virus in a given year. And then a pandemic just means that the epidemic is not isolated to a particular geographic area. It is uh, happening across the world. So of course we are currently in the midst of a pandemic. So here are the steps that we typically undertake when we're investigating an outbreak or one of these epidemic situations where we have more disease than we expect. Different sources will give you slightly different versions of this list. I took this one from um, a CDC module and something from Boston University. Um, but essentially, you always want to start by making sure that it's actually an outbreak. And that means that you really do have more cases than you would expect of a particular disease. And the reason this is important is because we can have situations where either there's kind of a clustering, it looks like there's a, a particular part of town or a particular uh, group of people within a community who are experiencing a disease. And so it might feel to them or it might look from the outside like there is an outbreak going on, um, but there's always random variation in terms of disease, and so we wanna make sure that it's truly above the threshold. And secondly, we wanna make sure we know what disease we're talking about. So again, there are lots of different conditions that manifest in the same way, meaning there are common symptoms for different um, diseases, and that shows up in your assignment six in the outbreak in Argentina, so sometimes things are misdiagnosed and we want to make sure, ideally through laboratory testing, that if we're identifying um, cases associated with an outbreak, that all of them truly have the same disease. So once we're sure that we have an outbreak and that we know what the disease is or that agent is, we want to make a case definition. And a case definition just gives us parameters for who counts as a case and who doesn't. So counting is always important in epidemiology. And as we go along, I'll talk about some of those measures that we use like an attack rate to understand causes of disease. So having a true accurate denominator is the first step in understanding um, why people are getting sick. So making sure you have a clear case definition that's used consistently is very helpful. And we'll do some examples of those coming up too. So then you wanna find everybody who's sick you want to make sure you identify all cases, get information from them, so that you can do the descriptive epidemiology, the person, place, and time characteristics of this outbreak. Who's getting sick? Where are they? Um, and when did they get sick? Over what time period are we talking about? And that can help us develop hypotheses about what caused the outbreak to happen. Um, and then we want to test those hypotheses so this could be doing any number of different types of studies. Um, often we do case control studies during outbreak situations um, just to compare different exposures, but it's also possible to do cohort studies and other kinds of things. And sometimes we may find that our first hypothesis wasn't uh, accurate, and so we might need to do the develop and test hypotheses sequence a few times. Once we feel like we have a pretty good answer that we're, that we're confident in our results and we know what caused the outbreak, um, then we can start to implement those control and prevention strategies. And finally, we wanna make sure we close the loop. So communicate findings with the public, let them know when an outbreak has ended, let them know what the cause was, do some education if needed uh, to prevent future outbreaks, and then also communicate it to the broader scientific community so that other um, jurisdictions can learn from our experience. 
So we talked earlier in the semester about surveillance systems, <clears throat> and there are a few that are unique to infectious diseases and that are really helpful for identifying epidemics. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these um, today, but I've included links here so you can spend some time on your own if you're interested looking at what kind of data are available through them. Uh, so the first that I will talk a little bit more about is the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. And that's uh, hosted by the CDC. Um, essentially, there is a list of diseases that must be reported by healthcare professionals or labs um, or health departments whenever they're detected. Um, I'll say more about what kinds of diseases go onto that list in just a minute. But there is a, a, an interface through CDC where you can get access to those data. And they're also typically published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, MMWR every um, week and annually, there's a, there's a summary of those. Foodborne outbreaks are relatively common and we'll, I'm, I'll be using a few examples of those in this lecture. And again, assignment six is actually a foodborne outbreak. And FoodNet or the Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network is a very good source for looking at uh, foodborne outbreaks across the US. And you can see I have a link to a general page here along with where you can actually see the data itself. Uh, finally, there is this Influenza-like Illness Surveillance Network or ILNet, and there's a weekly US Influenza Surveillance Report called FluView. Um, so those two links are here. Again, I'm not gonna spend time on that today, but all of these are, are interesting. And if you um, like knowing more about data, I recommend you check them out on your own. This slide is an illustration of that epidemic threshold, and this is actually looking at uh, flu cases over the uh, time period of 2010 to 2015. So the solid black lines, so the bottom one as it's labeled here, is the seasonal baseline. So again, this is kind of the endemic level of flu that we would expect to see every year. You see the seasonality to it where in the winter and spring we expect to see more cases than in the summer and fall. And then the epidemic threshold is the upper black bar. And so um, I'm actually not sure in this image how far apart that is, but my guess is that it's one or two standard deviations higher than the baseline. So if the blue line of the actual counts of cases goes above that top black line, that indicates that an epidemic has occurred in that year. And so this figure is illustrating that um, actually over this time period, four out of the five years, we reached, we crossed that epidemic threshold. So we reached epidemic levels or outbreaks of flu in each of those seasons in um, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015. So back to the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, which I said I'd say a little bit more about. Um, so currently there are about 120 diseases that are captured by this system. And they are largely infectious diseases, but there's also some bioterrorism agents that are in there um, and a handful of non-infectious conditions uh, along with sexually transmitted infections. Every year there's almost 3 million diseases reported through this system. Um, and as I said before, these are the diseases that healthcare providers and labs need to report to their local health department, um, or sometimes the local health department might do the testing directly. Uh, but then those local health departments send the disease information up to the CDC and the CDC aggregates it and makes it available on, that, um, on their site. So let's go to uh, talking about what a case definition case definition is for a few minutes. And as I mentioned before, a case definition is the way that we can assure that everyone we're counting in our outbreak really is part of that outbreak. So as I say here, the purpose of uh, having a case definition is so you can standardize who is included both within your own outbreak and then also over time. So if you're comparing different outbreaks, you know that the people had consistent symptoms and we define things in the same way. Um, so again, this is helping us get that descriptive epidemiology information, the person, place, and time. And so that's what's going to go into your definition 
and usually we also have clinical information as part of the case definition. So that could include symptoms, uh, the, the course of the disease, and tests, or some combination of those things. And so typically we have three different levels within a case definition. We have suspected cases, probable cases, and confirmed cases. So I have a couple examples here. Um, the first one is from a pertussis outbreak. And so you can see that this um, includes, you know, how long the illness lasted, when the onset was. So this is this outbreak was confined to a specific time period from September 2004 to February 2005. Um, and it also focused on people who were Amish and living in this one county in Washington. And so it says a confirmed case means that somebody had to have a lab confirmed PCR test for pertussis or a direct link to a lab confirmed case. And then everything else, any other clinical case was considered probable. Uh, I wanted to share with you the current case definitions being used for COVID-19, and these are from the WHO situation report as of uh, yesterday, March 31st. So for this outbreak, a suspect case is anybody who has the symptoms that hopefully we've all heard about by now, fever, respiratory disease, specifically cough and shortness of breath are the most common, and a history of travel to or living in somewhere where there's community transmission of COVID happening in the 14 days leading up to the symptom onset. Or it could be an, another, def, another way to be counted as a suspect case is to have those symptoms and have been in contact with a confirmed or probable case in the two weeks before symptom onset. Or the last option is somebody who has severe acute respiratory illness and again, that's fever and at least one sign of respiratory disease that required hospitalization and that any other cause has been ruled out. So those are suspect cases. So that's kind of the lowest threshold for being a potential case. Um, a probable case is somebody who counted, who had all those suspect criteria and got tested um, for the virus that causes COVID-19, but that test was inconclusive. And by inconclusive, they specifically mean that the lab doing the test, the lab result came back as inconclusive. Or um, somebody could also be considered probable if they met the suspect criteria and they couldn't get testing. You know, maybe it was too late in the disease course or there weren't tests available, um, but somebody could be probable if they could not be tested. And then, so that's kind of the second level. And then the highest level of evidence for a case is a confirmed case. Mm -hmm. And so that's somebody who has a lab test that shows infection with the virus that causes COVID-19. So that's SARS-CoV-2 infection, whether or not they have signs and symptoms. <clears throat> so that's the working definitions right now for the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, and uh, the WHO does update these periodically. And so their situation report is the place that I recommend you go to get updated information. But the other thing I wanna mention is when you look at their situation report, maybe I'll just pull this one up real quick. Um, they include tables, surveillance tables, showing the number of cases and deaths and you can see here it's total confirmed cases. So it's only this last definition, people who have had a test for the virus that causes COVID-19 um, and it came back positive. So these are only confirmed cases that they're using as their denominator. So when we do things like calculate the case fatality rate, it's only using those confirmed cases. So if you are ever out in the field in the future and are working on an outbreak, the good news is that the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and CDC have worked together to make um, standard case definitions for all of the diseases on um, the nationally notifiable disease list and an, a large number of others. And so you can just start with those and then adapt it to fit your needs. So you don't have to start from scratch if you ever are working an outbreak and need a case definition. Okay, so we wanna make sure that we're collecting good data. So we need a case definition. And then uh, while tables are nice, as you could 
see briefly from that WHO report, it's very hard to look at a table and really understand what's going on. Um, and certainly doesn't give you the overtime piece of information, which is really helpful for understanding an epidemic and the behavior of it. So uh, we often calculate an attack rate when we are looking at uh, what might be causing an outbreak. And an attack rate is really just an incidence rate. So this is something that we've talked about before in class. The denominator is just the people at risk and the numerator is the number of people who actually become ill. Um, here we go. So it's just the incidence rate, the attack rate is just the incidence rate of the disease that we're looking at among people who have been exposed. So you calculate it by dividing the number of sick people out of the number of exposed people, um, the exposed people being the people at risk. Usually we represent an attack rate as a percentage, so we often multiply that by 100 <clears throat> to calculate the percentage. And then we can use the attack rate, which again is just telling us about how many of the exposed people got sick. Um, we can use the attack rate for the exposed and compare it to the attack rate for the unexposed to come up with a relative risk. We'll do an example. So let's say you work at this hospital and this example comes from a textbook. Um, and people have, have gotten sick at this hospital. So you've noticed a larger than expected number of cases of a particular illness. And um, you wanna understand what might have caused people to get sick. So the way to, to set up the table for an outbreak, a foodborne outbreak or another kind of outbreak, um, if you're gonna calculate the attack rate is to develop four columns. So you want people who ate the food item. So this is our exposed group. And then people who didn't eat the item. That's our unexposed group. And within each of those broad categories, the exposed and unexposed, you want to know how many people were exposed or were not exposed, and then how many people got sick. So for this apple juice row here, we can see, see 50 people drink apple juice, 10 of those 50 people got sick. And then 250 people said they didn't have apple juice and four to give those 250 people got sick. So on this next slide here, I show you how to calculate those attack rates. So it, again, it's just the ill, the number of people who are sick out of the people who were exposed. So 10 of 50 people, 10 out of 50 people um, who drank apple juice got sick. So that's a 20% attack rate. And then 40 out of the 250 people who didn't drink apple juice got sick. So it's a 16% attack rate there. And then using those two pieces of information together is really what can help us identify oops, what might be causing the outbreak. So the last step is to calculate the relative risk where we divide the attack rate in the exposed. So 20% by the attack rate in the unexposed, 16%. So here for apple juice, we get a relative risk of 1.25. And that means that people who drank apple juice had 1.25 times the risk of getting sick as people who didn't drink apple juice. Another way to say that is people who drank apple juice were 25% more likely to get sick um, than people who didn't drink apple juice. So we just go down the table and calculate the attack rate for each food item, divide the two to get the relative risk, um, and the bigger the relative risk, the more likely it is that that food item caused people to get sick. So as we scroll down here, we can see that taco salad is actually pretty high by normal standards for a relative risk. So people who ate taco salad are three times as likely to get sick as people who didn't eat taco salad. So we'd normally say that's pretty high, um, but as you can see here in this red row, uh, there is a 28 in our relative risk. So half over half almost 60 percent of people who ate the chip beef with sauce got sick and only two percent of people who didn't eat the chip beef with sauce got sick uh, so that gives us a relative risk of 28 and again that means people who ate chip beef were 28 times as likely to get sick as people who didn't eat it so that's a pretty good candidate for our cause it could be that maybe taco salads elevated because that beef 
could perhaps have been used to make both of them, or maybe the sauce is the problem and it was available on the um, as an option on your taco. So there could be some shared exposure going on here, or it could just be kind of a statistical anomaly and maybe the taco salad was fine. People who ate taco salad also just happened to eat chip beef more often. So this is kind of, we would, we would basically call these relative risk crude. We're not accounting for what else people ate. We're just um, calculating it for each item. And so then if we think that this chip beef and sauce is the problem, then we want to develop some hypotheses and see if we can test them. So, you know, one hypothesis is that the beef was bad, it was contaminated um, from the source, and so we could do some work to understand that. If there's any left in the refrigerator, we could test it, we could try to get in touch with the supplier, make sure it wasn't expired. Um, it could also be that the handling of the beef during the cooking process was, was not done correctly, so we could check things like refrigerator temperature to make sure it was held at the right temperature, cooking temperature to make sure things were getting hot enough, cleaning procedures within the kitchen to make sure there wasn't cross-contamination going on. Um, same thing with the sauce, we could look at how it was made, what the ingredients were, do, do some work to do some tracing and understand what each com how each component of this food was put together, how it was held after it was um, made, you know, maybe it was sitting on a counter and it got to be, you know, too cool or too warm um, and it allowed bacterial growth. So knowing what food item might have been the problem gives us information about how we can start to search for what went wrong in the process of making the food um, so that we can stop the outbreak and again prevent it in the future. I'm going to talk broadly about two different kinds of transmission. I know I'm jumping around a lot, sorry. <laughs> Normally in class we would talk about these in a little bit more isolation, but i um, just going to go through all of it today. So direct transmission means that um, the disease is spread through some sort of person-to-person -person contact. So that could be physical contact, like kissing, um, sex droplet contact, so that could be, you know, if you cough or sneeze on somebody and the saliva or droplets um, from your mouth or nose get on them and so the virus is transmitted directly that way. We usually call these contagious diseases because it can spread directly from one person to another. Lots of examples of this. Um, I put just a handful on here, so things like athlete's foot, mono, um, our direct transmission spread, meningitis, chicken pox, the flu, tuberculosis, measles, we can now add COVID-19 to this. Um, those are spread through coughing or sneezing. And then of course, lots of STIs out there, sexually transmitted infections, uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea, we've seen huge resurgences in over the past few years, um, but quite a few direct transmission routes for infectious diseases. And then the other broad category of transmission of disease is indirect. Um, and so this is that you're not coming into contact with somebody else's body surface or something directly out of their body, um, but there's kind of a, an in-between uh, vector or vehicle, something that is spreading the disease. So we usually call uh, things that are spread through food or water, so cholera and all of the foodborne outbreaks that we might look at, Shigella and Salmonella and E. coli, they're vehicle borne. So the virus or bacteria gets onto food or it gets in the water and that's how the disease is spread. There's also vector borne and so that's when there's some kind of an organism, a lot of times it's an insect that transmits the infectious agent from the source to the host. So any kind of mosquito borne diseases or tick borne diseases, Lyme disease, West Nile, uh, malaria, those are all vector-borne uh, transmission routes of infectious diseases. And then finally, airborne is probably maybe the least common. Um, there was some concern that COVID might be airborne initially, but it looks like it's not. Uh, tuberculosis is kind of the classic example of airborne indirect transmission. So this is when it's not that somebody with tuberculosis coughs directly on you and then you inhale that and get sick, that would be tr direct transmission. But with some viruses, 
they can actually kind of get stuck to things floating in the air. So dust in the air, um, the virus can get on there and remain airborne for quite a while. So, um, you know, if somebody with tuberculosis had been in the same room, or had been in a room and you weren't in there at the same time, but had been in a room and coughed, that virus could stay suspended in the air for potentially hours. And so you could come in at some later point, not have any direct crossover with that person and inhale that uh, droplet nuclei and potentially be infected that way. Now it does typically occur only when people are in pretty confined spaces with limited airflow, but that's, um, kind of an overstatement of how airborne transmission might work. <clears throat> okay, so again, we, we want to collect data, accurate data about the number of cases. We want to get details about people's symptom experience and their exposures. Um, and we can use this information to plot what we call an epidemic curve. And really all this is is plotting on a figure uh, the number of people who've gotten sick, so our y-axis axis is the number of people that are sick, and then our x-axis is when they got sick. Um, so it's, it's helpful for determining the type of spread because it's helpful for us to know, were, was everybody exposed at one point in time, and we might see this with a foodborne outbreak, everybody who ate at that hospital cafeteria, was it just the one day with the chip beef? That was the problem or was it happening over time um, so multiple multiple points in time or is it propagated meaning spread from person to person so here's a couple examples and these are <clears throat> kind of idealized situations at first and then i'll show you a real one um, so in this example we're looking at a point source outbreak and so there's an index case that means the first person who got sick, the first known case in this particular outbreak. And then what we see is that the next case that happens, happens at the minimum incubation period um, in time away from the index case. So an incubation period is how long it takes between the time you're exposed until you start showing symptoms. Because with all of these, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, Typically, there needs to be some reproduction within your system in order for it to reach a level where it actually causes you problems. Um, so the incubation period is the range of time over which you might get sick if you've been exposed to someone. And so with COVID, for example, it looks like it's um, up to 14 days. So maybe two to 14 days is the incubation period. It looks like the average might be around five days. Um, but all of that is useful information for looking at epidemic curves to understand how are things being spread. So if this were just a single point source outbreak and nobody else got, nobody else spread it person to person, um, we would expect to see that the, the second case occurs at the minimum incubation period time point. There would be a peak at the average incubation period right here around, um, where this purple arrow is pointing. And then it would start to decline and end at the maximum incubation period. Because if it was only this person making everybody else sick, we'd expect the last case to occur at the maximum incubation period time point. So that clearly doesn't happen in this figure, which means that, as it says in the title, there's a limited spread. So it's a point source. Most of these cases, all these cases here, are probably from this index case, but then we see another peak over here, which means some of those people then spread it to others because there's no way that this index case person was the cause of these cases over here at the end. So that, again, that gives us useful information um, about how, we, how the disease is spreading, how we might stop the epidemic. Here's another example um, of a propagated spread, and this one is a, a more <clears throat> uh, continuous propagation. So we have an index case. We see one peak here at the average incubation period. So this person probably got these people sick, but then these people got these people sick and so on. And then you start to see that these peaks start to merge and then we get a really big epidemic curve here. And so this is more like what we're seeing 
right now with COVID. So this is the figure one from the Wu and McGuigan article that you read last week um, that shows the in the kind of blue color is the date of onset of symptoms for people who ultimately became confirmed cases. You can see here in the legend that says confirmed cases only are included in this figure consistent with what WHO is reporting. And then the yellow is the date of diagnosis. So the curves essentially look the same regardless of whether you're looking at date of onset or date of diagnosis in terms of their shape. Um, but the time point is of course shifted. So it takes a couple days to get the test result back and people don't always go on the, you know, the moment that their symptoms start to get tested. So we expect this time lag between when people started feeling sick and then when the test result came back and confirmed that they had COVID-19. But this figure looks a lot like this last one here where we see initially there are just a few cases and a couple of peaks and then things really start to spread rapidly and we get this large epidemic peak. Um, you can see that the scale here is nearly 3,000 cases a day um, at the peak of the outbreak in China. If we're looking at the, the date of onset details and it goes closer to 4,000 when we look at the um, diagnosis date curve. So again, this is just an example. This is an epidemic curve um, and it's useful for us to understand how things are spreading. And then this is the global spread. So that, that article is just looking at the experience in China, which is basically reflected down here. This gold kind of color is the Western Pacific region of the world. Um, and so that's, this is sort of what's reflected in this figure here. This goes through February 11th. Um, so right about here, you see, we, we got another surge and that's partly because there, there may have been a surge in China, but this includes multiple other countries as well. And so uh, South Korea and Singapore started to experience some cases uh, around that time too. And you can see that in the Western Pacific region, happily their curve is going down. So um, they seem to be through the worst of it, but you can see here the pink color is Europe. And so uh, they perhaps are through their curve as well. Uh, certainly some countries within Europe have not reached their peak, but overall the region seems to be headed towards a downward trend. Um, purple is the Eastern Mediterranean. It's a little bit hard to tell since now the, the size of the bars below it are different. Looks like it's kind of holding steady. Um, and then the American region, which includes the US, is um, you know clearly still on the uptick here. And Africa has seen very few cases so far. But you know, if we look at the rest, the experience of the rest of the world, we would anticipate that their numbers will start to climb in the coming weeks. So one thing you probably have heard a fair amount about if you've been keeping up with the COVID news is herd immunity. And so I wanna make sure that you're clear on what that is. Um, essentially, it's just the idea that if everyone or if large segments of a population are naive to a disease or um, unprotected against it, so they have no immunity to a disease, then that disease is gonna spread pretty rapidly. And that's what this first figure is showing. So the blue figures represent people who are not immunized but are healthy. Yellow represents people who are immunized and healthy. And then red is people who are sick. So they don't have immunity to the disease they have symptoms and they're contagious. So in the situation where you have even just a small number of people, just two people sick in a population, disease is gonna spread rapidly through an unimmunized population uh, because each of them will infect a relatively small number of people, but then each of those people is likely to contact other people who have no immunity and so the disease spreads quickly. And so this is what we've seen with COVID because while most of us have been exposed to a coronavirus at some point in our lives. We haven't been exposed to this one. So, uh, you know, depending on immune response and other factors, many of us will develop some sort of um, illness as a result of it, not always symptoms, but we're, we will probably be infected by it if we're exposed. And so the second picture um, 
perhaps represents kind of the, the situation that we're in now. So there's a small number of people who have natural or acquired um, immunity to a disease, and there's still just two people who become sick. Um, so we still see a pretty dramatic spread through the population because, again, a lot of the sick people are interacting with each other. There's not very many people who are immune, and so disease spreads quickly. But the last picture is what we want with herd immunity, and this is, this is the illustration of herd immunity itself. If most of the people in a population are not at risk of getting disease, if they can't become sick, um, either because they've had the disease before, they've been immunized against it, they have some natural defenses, it's much less likely that one of these sick, pe sick people will actually come into contact with somebody who's at risk. So you can see this person's almost completely surrounded by yellow figures, um, so they only infect one other person. And similarly, down here at the bottom, uh, this person is surrounded by yellow figures. So the disease is not able to spread if there aren't hosts nearby um, to, to help the disease move through the population. So that's what we want. That's why we give people vaccines is because we want to have a protected population so that in those rare instances where someone does get a, an infectious disease, that they're less likely to come into contact with somebody who's also at risk of getting it. And so we keep the likelihood of epidemics down. Uh, a measure that is really helpful, and you also may have heard of because um, there are efforts underway to calculate this reproduction number or the R0 for COVID-19, um, that represents the number of people that one infected person could spread disease to, assuming this kind of worst case scenario up here. So in a, in a population of completely unprotected um, people, so people who don't have any immunity, how many people can one sick person spread the disease to? That's the reproductive number, uh, the R0. And so you can see in this table here, um, it's ordered by the reproduction number. So for mumps, it's actually really low. We've had a couple cases of mumps on our campus in the last few years. And typically, a person with mumps could spread it to between four and seven other people, assuming everyone around them had no immunity to mumps. Um, kind of similar numbers for polio and smallpox. They start to creep up a little bit for diphtheria and rubella. And then you see pertussis and measles, which we've also seen nationally a number of concerning outbreaks of in the past few years. Those have much higher r nots, so it's much more likely that you would spread pertussis or measles to other people um, if they didn't have any immunity to it. And this r not feeds into this threshold percentage, which is the other figure in this table. And the threshold percentage tells us what percent of a population needs to be immune, to be protected from infection, in order to prevent an outbreak from happening. And so as you look across these numbers, they tend to be higher for diseases that have higher r not. So usually, if an agent is more infectious, that means we need more community protection to prevent an outbreak. But that threshold percentage depends on some other things like if there's a vaccine, how effective it is, how long immunity lasts, what kind of transmission routes are possible for the disease. So it's not a perfect correlation, but um, generally that's, that's what we see. And so far I would say that I've seen reproduction number estimates um, that seem to be calculated based on what's actually happening in the community, which again, um, well, I think they're underestimating right now because I've seen like 2.5, and that seems pretty low um, for a true reproduction number, especially given that we know that this has been moving pretty quickly through populations. Um, so we'll see what it turns out to be. I think we'll have to wait a while for all the data to be in. Um, but the threshold percentages, as you can see, generally at least 80%. 85% we often use as kind of a guide, um, just a blanket. If we can vaccinate, immunize 85% of a population, then we usually have a pretty good chance at preventing outbreaks. So that's why we need to keep vaccination numbers high, and that's why we get concerned from a public health perspective when we start to see them dropping into the 60s and 70s, um, and even lower in some particular um, subpopulations because it means that if somebody in that, in that population 
gets one of these diseases, it's much more likely that it's going to spread and we're going to have an outbreak situation. So one thing that we often talk and think about in public health is eradication. So of course it would be easier if these diseases were not around, we wouldn't have to worry about people getting vaccinated against them. Um, but to date, smallpox is the only disease that we have successfully eradicated. Uh, polio, we've gotten very close, but it's, it's hard to kind of get over uh, the hump here at the end, partly because of the way that it's spread. Um, so people can shed polio virus, um, and so there's a fecal oral transmission route. And uh, there are two different types of vaccines. So a lot of the vaccines that we use, especially in the states, um, are like attenuated vaccines or not even um, just pieces of, of viruses, for example. So instead of giving people something that could actually make them sick, um, there's some surface protein or a piece of DNA that our immune system can then learn to recognize but that cannot itself make us sick. So this is why you know, it's impossible to get the flu from the flu vaccine because there is not a whole flu virus um, in there. It's just components of it to train our immune system to recognize particular surface proteins on the influenza virus. Um, so that is partially true with polio. There are different versions of the polio vaccine. One is a live virus, which means you actually give people a small amount of polio. And so, um, that is the one that's concerning because people can shed it and infect others. There's also been a vaccine derived version of polio that has started to circulate. Um, and so now there's, I believe, at least in some countries, there are more cases of that than of wild polio virus. Um, so kind of negative unintended consequences, but also something that sort of needed to happen as part of this process, not needed to happen, but the, the live polio virus needs to be given in some situations because it's more uh, so easier to transport, more kind of more shelf stable, I guess, than the inactivated one. And also the inactivated one has to be given by shot and the live one can be a drop on um, someone's tongue. So it's much easier to administer. You don't need trained healthcare professionals to do live polio virus um, vaccination. And so that's why we continue to use it, especially in more rural areas of the world. So efforts still underway to eradicate polio, but lots of challenges that have cropped up in addition to those practical ones, um, conflict and um, migration, those sorts of things also make it difficult to keep up with, with uh, vaccine efforts, vaccination efforts in different populations. Guinea worm is an interesting story. Um, if you click on these links, you'll see both the life cycle and a video about the Carter Center, which was uh, former President Jimmy Carter's, is former President Jimmy Carter's foundation that focuses on guinea worm eradication. Uh, so I encourage you to watch those, but I won't play them right now. Um, and I just wanna mention flu again, because uh, it is one of those unique ones that I think we will not be able to eradicate potentially ever, but not anytime soon for sure, because there are multiple reservoirs, so several different animal species that can have um, influenza infections. And the last few flu pandemics have resulted from it crossing from those animals to us and us not having immunity to the, the virus that resulted. It mutates pretty quickly. Um, and so that makes it a challenge to keep up with. That's why every year, even if you get the flu vaccine, you may still get flu because there's multiple strain circulating and it mutates quickly enough that um, we can't really keep up with it. And this is a picture from the 1918 flu pandemic in which 50 million people are estimated to have died. Uh, this was happening during World War I and, and about 16 million people died during that war. So it was a really devastating uh, pandemic. And in particular, it was more likely to kill young adults than other age groups, which is certainly unusual, something diff different than what we see with the current COVID-19 um, as well. And as a result of the 1918 pan flu, uh, the life expectancy in the US actually declined by 12 years since so many young people died. A few last slides and comments, um, just to come back to the vaccine preventable diseases. Um, 
this, the kind of background figure that's showing here is measles cases. Um, and you can see that once vaccines were introduced, the number of cases of measles per year, and this is in thousands, so went from 600,000 or so a year um, to less than a thousand, less than a hundred, I think even in some of these years. And so that's when we start to see vaccine coverage drop. People feel like there is no longer a risk of getting the disease. And so it seems like the risk of vaccination outweighs the risk of the disease itself. Um, and so that's when we have kind of a shift in the the public perception of the need for vaccination and, and we see those rates start to drop. Uh, but as a result, we've started to see more cases of measles, um, same thing for pertussis. So after these dramatic drops following the introduction of vaccine, our success actually is sort of the, the culprit here that leads people to again feel like perhaps risks of vaccination outweigh risks of disease. And so vaccine rates drop, which means the disease starts to have a resurgence. So here are just the last, <clears throat> a few last resources. Um, if you wanna read more, MMWR is a great uh, source of information about the diseases that are occurring. CDC has a number of case studies on its website that's linked here, the epi case studies link. Um, and then there's actually a pretty fun game called Sol Solve the Outbreak that CDC developed. So if you wanna go through the steps of an outbreak investigation, um, in an interactive way, I recommend taking a look at that. So again, assignment six covers an outbreak in Argentina. The materials are posted there and you might wanna refer back to that slide that showed the steps in an outbreak investigation as you're working through it.